Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar. Uh, and what we're going to be doing today is uh, rendering the inside of a pinball machine. Uh, I'm sure most of you saw the uh, image from the newsletter that was sent out, and that's uh, that's essentially what we're going to be recreating today. And now I, I do understand that most of you at your jobs uh, on a day-to-day -day basis are not rendering the inside of pinball machines, but uh, this webinar has basically been designed to teach some, some concepts that will be universal uh, inside Keyshot regardless of whatever you're when rendering. And uh, we'll be using this as sort of a fun project to help uh, explain and illustrate um, a lot of common rendering concepts. So without further ado, uh, let's go ahead and get started here. And the first thing we're going to work on is the, the pinball. And we'll start by actually creating a metal material for this. And I'm instead of pulling from the library, I'm just going to edit materials uh, on the fly as we go about this webinar. And um, I, I guess as time has gone on and I've become more and more experienced inside Keyshot, I tend to do this more often than actually pulling from uh, materials from the library. Uh, I guess it, it certainly does help in creating a more custom look. And uh, as you get more and more experience, I, I think you guys will uh, be looking for a, a very specific look in your materials. And the material library may get you there, it may not. Um, and if it doesn't, um, I certainly suggest uh, creating materials from scratch. So uh, what I'll do is I'll double click on the pinball here, and we'll change this from a diffuse material type over to a metal. And what that does is it does create a very nice, uh, perfectly polished chrome look. But there's one inherent problem here, and that's the fact that it is uh, way too perfect. And a lot of times when things end up looking CG, computer generated, um, the reason they look that way and they don't look completely realistic is the fact that they are too perfect. So uh, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and add some imperfections to this. And we're going to do that uh, a couple ways. First, we're going to add roughness. And what this is doing uh, when you increase the slider is it's actually adding microscopic levels of imperfection to the surface of this material. And when you do that, um, you the roughness parameter does depend on this uh, glossy sample setting down here. And basically, the higher you increase the setting, the more accurate the rendered result of your rough material is going to be. If you have no roughness applied at all, then you can keep this glossy sample setting at zero. Uh, you certainly don't need to increase this at all if you have no roughness. Now, as you do increase this glossy sample setting, it will uh, take a toll on performance. It does take more processing power to actually calculate that. And uh, so while you're working, I suggest staying between a range of 8 to 16. Uh, or 32 at the very most, or, or even 64. Now, if you don't see the glossy sample setting there in your material parameters, you want to go to Edit, Preferences, and make sure that Show Advanced uh, Settings is checked. Okay, so another way that we can really start to uh, add more visual interest to this pinball and make it look more realistic is by adding a bump map. And what a bump map does is it uses black and white values to uh, show areas that are raised and areas that are lowered. And it's used to essentially bring out detail in a material that uh, essentially wouldn't be very realistic uh, to model. So for example, on this pinball, you might have uh, some scratches and things from the pinball being bounced around the machine. And you know it's, it's not very practical to go in and model every individual scratch. So we'll go ahead and use an image to help us uh, bring out that uh, detail in this material. And I'll go ahead and bring up Photoshop here and load in an image, which, uh, by the way, in case you aren't aware, there's a very amazing website out there uh, for whenever you're looking for textures for your projects. It's called cgtextures.com. And all these textures that are presented on this site are available free of charge. Uh, all you have to do is set up an account and 
with the free account, you get a 15 megabyte daily quota. And all these textures here are extremely high quality and they're very well organized, so you can always come here and find pretty much exactly what you're looking for. Uh, the only licensing restriction on these uh, is that you can't uh, package these textures up and ship them as, say, a texture library or some sort of competing product uh, to CG textures. Uh, but in terms of uh, using them on commercial pr uh, projects, you know, private projects or personal projects, it's all, uh, you know, free of charge for you to use. Uh, like I said, the only restriction on the free account is a 15 megabyte daily quota. Now, we'll go under Metal here, and I've already downloaded uh, a Metal uh, Scratches texture. And so I'll go ahead and go into Photoshop here, open that up, and we're going to do a little bit of editing on this uh, to essentially make it more suitable for a bump map. Now, one uh, major problem with this texture, as is, go ahead and, is that uh, there are seams. What I mean by that is if you repeat this texture across a model, you're going to see seams. So if I duplicate this and copy and paste, so essentially if I repeat this texture, we will have these seams. And you can see where that texture is actually repeated. So I'm going to show you a trick to go ahead and make this seamless so that as you repeat it, uh, you won't see these visible seams. And what we're going to be doing is using the clone stamp tool along with a filter uh, called offset. So we'll go to filter, other, offset. And what this is basically doing is it's taking uh, the, the edges of the image and it's flipping them inward so that the edges essentially become the center and uh, the, the new edges are basically what was in the middle of the image, which is already uh, seamless. And so you can set uh, any value you want here on the horizontal and vertical offset. Uh, you just want to make sure that you can see the visible the seams uh, where the texture is repeated. Okay, so next, now that we have our, our edges in the center of the image, I'm going to use the clone stamp. And you use this by holding the Alt key or Option key on Mac. And if you left click on the image, basically what that's doing is that's taking a picture of all the pixels that are below the cursor there. And when you paint, it's going to sample those pixels and, and paint them elsewhere in the image. And when you're doing this, it's good practice to sample from different areas of the image and paint as you go. That way you kind of you avoid the uh, you know, repeated sort of look. You want to try and uh, break up any repetition, any repeated patterns as much as possible when, when doing this. Okay, so now what we've done is we've cleaned up our seams. Uh, sometimes you'll want to go ahead and do another offset uh, just in case. So if you go to filter other offset again, uh, you see right here we can see a little bit of a seam remaining. Uh, you may want to do this one or two times. It all depends if you still see a seam after you do the offset. So if we do offset again, and it looks pretty good there. Now let me show you the difference. So this was our original texture here. And you can see when we repeated it, we do have those uh, visible seams. Let's go ahead and pull this one in. And I'll hide the underlying layers so we can see it, see our seamless one. So if I copy and paste this and repeat it, repeat it, and repeat it, uh, no visible seams. Certainly you can see um, you know, a repeated pattern here. So when you are creating seamless textures, you'll kind of want to try to avoid areas of, of very high contrast. Uh, so you can see right there in the center of the image that that stands out as it's repeated. But nonetheless, it looks quite a bit better than uh, the look we had before, which was that. Okay, so the next thing I want to do is go ahead and select these scratches and isolate them on their own layer so that we can add a little bit more contrast 
between uh, the scratches and the uh, smooth surface that's going to make up our bump map. So the first thing I'll do is I'll go ahead and desaturate this image, make a new layer, image adjustments, desaturate, okay, and I will go to select color range, select the scratches, and as I click on this image, it's going to add to a selection. So if I sample a color here, it's going to select everything that makes up that color within the image. And there's a tolerance that you can set, this fuzziness setting. And it will basically look out for any colors that are within a certain range of the color you sample. So if I go all the way to zero, it's only going to select the colors that I actually click. As I start to increase this, it will select the colors I click along with anything that's close uh, to that color. So what we've done there is we've sampled the scratches and what I will do is I'll go ahead and press Control J and what that did once the pixels were selected is it put the scratches on a new layer. And underneath the scratches layer I'm going to fill it with uh, white, just a solid white color and this is what's going to make up our bump map. And I can even uh, go ahead and make these scratches a bit darker just to add a bit more contrast and that's going to make our bump map effect uh, a bit more pronounced. Okay, so we'll go ahead and save this out. We'll call this Metal Scratches Bump JPEG, and we'll save it out. Okay, next, uh, the other thing I would like to do is I'll go ahead and save this out as a color map, and we'll just have that available to add a little bit more distress to our metal material and see how that ends up looking. So I'll save this out as metal scratches color, and we basically have the textures that we need uh, to finish texturing up the pinball. Okay, so back inside Keyshot, let's go ahead and load in our bump map first. So Metal Scratches Bump, and you can see uh, already it's added in these scratches, and like I said, it helps bring out detail in a material that's not very practical to model. It is certainly a bit too pronounced, and so what we can do is we can go ahead and knock back this height. And we can also reduce the scale of the texture so that we get um, smaller uh, scratches. Okay, so that is producing a pretty nice look for us. Uh, let's go ahead and load in our color map as well and see what that does for us. So under the texture tab, I'll go ahead and hit load, and I'll load in Metal Scratches color. Now, one thing that we've already done is we've set the scale on our bump map. And these are essentially the same two images, uh, just a little bit different color settings. And I'd like to make sure that my color map lines up with the bump map. So what you can do under the bump map uh, section is press sync. And then if I move one of these sliders, it's going to ensure that the color map lines up exactly with the bump map. It's going to apply these same scale settings, uh, the same position settings, uh, everything, so that those images uh, do line up well together. And if we take a look there, um, you know, that's, that's a lot more realistic than just a perfectly polished uh, chrome. And depending on what you're going for, you may want a nice level of disruption in your material, or you might want a, a clean and polished look. Uh, the clean and polished look is certainly very easy to achieve and it happens naturally, and, but if you want to add a bit of disruption to it, these are a couple good techniques that you can use for that. Uh, the other thing you can do if your texture is a bit uh, pronounced, you can start to drop the intensity and that will you know, make it less visible or you can bring it up even higher and it will increase the effect of whatever texture you have applied. Uh, this setting is available under all the materials whenever you have a texture applied. And one other thing I would like to show you is um, this modulate feature. If I click modulate, 
What that does now is it essentially blends your texture with whatever the color of your material is. So if I wanted to make this, say, a green or any other sort of color, I could do so by pressing that modulate feature and selecting a color. And like I said, that's going to blend your material color uh, with your texture. In this case, I do want um, you know, just a standard metal color. So I'll leave modulate off and let the texture go ahead and define the color of this material. We'll go ahead and add a little bit more roughness here too. And we'll increase our glossy samples a little bit. Now, once I am happy with this material, um, you know, if I have other objects in the scene that require the same material, there's no sense in necessarily setting up this material over and over and over again. So what I can do is I can copy and paste it from this pinball over to other pinballs in the machine in the model. And I can do so by pressing shift left click and shift right click to paste on other areas. And that's essentially uh, copied the material that we have with the texture settings and pasted it onto this section of the model. Now I do have another pinball that's hidden over here and we'll go ahead and apply this material to. And while we're at it, I'll go ahead and make these rails a metal material. So I'll double click on that and change it from diffuse over to metal. And I can go ahead and change the color just a little bit, maybe to sort of separate it from the pinballs a little bit. And I'll add a bit of roughness so that it's not perfectly reflective and increase the glossy samples. Okay, the next thing I'd like to talk about is the anisotropic material. And before we... <coughs> excuse me. Before we get talking about that, Let's go ahead and look at photo reference of an actual anisotropic material. And we'll go ahead and show you what it is uh, we're trying to recreate. So I click on here, we can see this is the difference between an anisotropic material. Look at the specular highlight here, the reflection of the light source in the scene. It's very uniform, uh, whereas the specular highlight on this is stretched. And that's what happens with an anisotropic material. You'll see it on brushed metals. You'll see it on, uh, you know, essentially volume knobs on receivers. This is a good example of, of something like that. And I'll show you how we can go ahead and create that. Keyshot does come with an anisotropic material type. And we'll assign that to the walls of the pinball machine. So I'll change this from diffuse to anisotropic. And what I'll do is I'll go ahead and drop the diffuse color all the way down, and I'll turn the specular color all the way up. Now the reason I turned the diffuse color all the way down is because I'm trying to simulate a metal. And there's one thing you should probably understand with the anisotropic material, and that's if you are trying to create a metal, you want to make sure you have absolutely no diffuse color. If you are trying to make a colored metal, you'll want to change that on the specular channel. So if I want a green metal, I'll make the specular green while the diffuse remains black. And what I'll do here is let's position our camera so that we can see the reflection of the pinball in the pinball machine walls. And we'll start to edit some parameters of this anisotropic material so you can see what's going on here. So I'll turn the roughness uh, all the way down. So here we have perfectly reflective pinball machine walls. Now if I start to say increase the roughness Y, look what that does for the, the reflections. It's uh, stretching them vertically. I can also stretch uh, the reflections on the X at the same time. So that will start to uh, stretch the, the rough uh, 
brushed effect uh, horizontally as well as vertically. And what else you can do is you can control the angle of the anisotropic uh, reflections. So if I start to rotate this, I can change them to sort of be diagonal brushed or horizontal brushed. Or if I wanted horizontal, I can just uh, increase the roughness on the X. And I think for this, uh, for this render, we'll go ahead and go with the horizontal stretched uh, look. Okay, so there is another type of anisotropic material. And as I mentioned uh, earlier, there's a, a radial brush pattern. And we're going to do that over here on the, the pinball machine uh, flipper pins. But instead of using an anisotropic material, we're going to use a bump map to go ahead and create that effect. And so I'll double click on this and change the material type from diffuse over to metal. And we'll zoom in there. And what I want is essentially, like I said, that radial uh, brushed effect. So what I need is essentially some concentric circles to load in as a bump map to create that look. And I'll go ahead and show you inside Photoshop how we can do that very easily and very quickly. So I'll create a new document, and it's going to be a very small document. I'm only going to do one pixel wide by 16 pixels high. And what I'm going to do here is fill the first half of the image with black. And I'm going to fill the bottom half with white. And if I go to Edit, Define Pattern, I'm going to call this Lines. And now I'll go ahead and create a full-size document that's actually going to be our texture. And what we've done is we've created a pattern that Photoshop is going to use uh, to, fill this, to fill this new document that we've created. So I go to Edit, Fill, and I change the contents from white over to pattern, and I select our line texture that we just created. See so what that's done is that's filled our document automatically for us with these uh, repeated lines. It's certainly um, tough on the eyes to look at. <laughs> and I'll go ahead and save this out. Call it lines.jpg. And we're going to use this for another part of the pinball machine. And so we do have that texture saved. Let's go ahead and turn these into concentric circles. So we go to Filter, Distort, and go to Polar Coordinates. And we have Rectangular to Polar selected. Watch what that does. That creates our concentric circles for us. So I'll go ahead and save this out as Radial Brush. JPEG. And that's what we're going to use as our bump map. So if I go to the bump map tab and load in that image, one other thing I'll need to do is set the projection to either planar X, Y, or Z. Uh, this will depend on uh, how you've imported your model and what orientation it was when you brought it in. And basically what this is doing is it's projecting that texture directly down on top of this when I have it set to planar Z. Like I said, it will vary depending on how your model uh, actually came into Keyshot. And now I'll go ahead and reduce the scale of this. And also the effect is, is very intense. And most of the time with bump maps, you will need to dial this default value back. So I'll start to drop this down, and we'll get something a little more subtle happening here. 
and I'll select position. And once I have position selected, I can actually interactively place this texture on top of the material. So we can try and get this in the center of this uh, cylinder shape here. Okay, so that gave us a pretty nice looking uh, radial brushed effect there. And of course you can add roughness if you like. And as usual, um, I am happy with this material and I would like to copy and paste it to another section. So I can press shift left click and shift right click to paste it over here. And it comes in pretty well positioned. Looks like I might need to do a little bit of centering on it. So if I select the bump map, click on position, and click on that surface, I can start to move this around. All right, starting to come together, starting to look pretty good. Now the other thing I'd like to do is over inside the other section of this pinball machine, uh, we have a spring and a plunger that's actually going to fire the ball into the machine. And I'll create a metal material on the spring. So I'll change it from diffuse to metal. And I'll go ahead and give it a slightly different color. And I'll add some roughness to break up those reflections and increase the glossy samples. We'll do 532. And on this plunger itself, I'll change the material type to metal. And remember those lines texture that we created? Uh, this is where we're actually going to use those. So just to refresh your memory. This was the texture we created. And we're going to use that to create uh, ridges that run along the length of this, uh, this plunger here. So we'll go to bump map, select load, bring in our lines texture, and again we'll go ahead and knock back the height on that, and we'll reduce the scale a bit to get this uh, repeated even more along the length of this. And I'll also go ahead and add a bit of roughness. Uh, you'll notice I do that a lot, um, and, and again it just comes down to you know when you're trying to create realistic metals and things, not everything in the real world is, is incredibly perfect the way uh, things can be reproduced inside the computer. And I'll change the color a little bit. Maybe a blue steel sort of look going on. And we'll let that rest up for a second and see what we get. Uh, so far it's looking pretty realistic and, and not too bad for uh, considering that we haven't really invested that much time as of yet to get to this point. Okay. So moving on, let's go ahead and uh, start to tune the inside of the pinball machine on, on the board. So I'll double click this and I think the, the material type we'll go ahead and use is paint and we'll set it to a dark color. And as we've done with most of our materials to this point, um, we'll go ahead and add a bit of roughness to this. So that's going to take our reflections and it's going to break them up a bit. Next what we're going to do is we're going to put a texture on top of this. And I'm going to show you a technique that when you are projecting uh, textures in, in a planar manner, 
you know, a technique that you can use to essentially control where your textures are placed quite a bit more specifically than if you just randomly apply a texture. And the first thing we're going to do for that is we're going to position the camera above the model. And under the camera tab, I'm going to select orthographic. And what that's done is that's gotten rid of any perspective that we have in our scene. And what we're going to do is we're going to use a screenshot of this as reference inside Photoshop. So let that res up for a second and we'll save out a screenshot. And we'll load that into Photoshop. Okay, next I'll go ahead and pull in a texture that I'm going to use for this. Okay, and I'll go ahead and rotate this so that it's upright. Let's see. Flatten this image first so that we don't get any warnings about missing fonts. Okay, so 90 degrees clockwise and that orients the image upright. And the next step here is I'm going to go ahead and load in our reference image that we saved out from Keyshot. And we're going to use that to position our textures. Okay, so this texture is extremely high res. And you know the reason for that is you know, we're going to be doing a large rendering and I want to make sure that we don't get areas on here that are pixelated. And essentially what you want to make sure is you know if if you if your image, say, is 1920 by 1080, and it fills up a certain amount of the screen, so if my texture is projected across this board and I'm rendering a 1920 by 1080 image, the texture should at least be 1920 by 1080 to avoid pixelation. And that's why I've used um, such a high res image here. Now, for my reference photo, what I need to do is go ahead and increase the size of that so it matches the size of my texture. Now, the, the fact that this becomes pixelated it really doesn't matter. All we're using this is sort of a placement guide. That's the only uh, purpose that this image has. So that we know where our elements are and we can place our textures uh, in the correct spots in relation to them. So I'll go ahead and drop the opacity of our, our reference image there. So this texture reference and I'm going to duplicate our background layer so that's so that we have a copy of that to edit okay so we'll go ahead and place the Keyshot logo sort of here in the, in the center of the board. And this Keyshot 2 by Luxion, I'm going to go ahead and bring it down so it's positioned more in this center area here. So what I'll do is I'll select that area and I press Control J to duplicate that to a new layer. And now I can move that independently of everything else. And if I press Control T, uh, that brings up my free transform options and I can scale this down and position it right there in the center. So on the layer below, uh, where we used to have our Keyshot 2 by Luxion, I'll fill that with black so that we get rid of that. And the other thing I want to do is soften this hard edge here. And so I'll go ahead and just grab my paint brush tool. And I'll get a soft round brush. Set this the color to black. And paint to soften this edge. OK. 
Okay, so that's looking pretty good. The next thing I want to do, um, and I'll show you, this is, you know, where this technique really, really will help you in customizing your textures. So we have this ramp right here, and a lot of times in pinball machines, when you have ramps and things, there'll be arrows that lead up to that. I've already saved out an Illustrator file uh, that has an arrow. Go ahead and open up Illustrator. And I'll open up the arrow. And I'll drag and drop that into our Photoshop document. Now the nice thing about using uh, vector graphics is they can be any resolution. So it doesn't matter what size you create them at. I can essentially get any size texture that I need uh, from this vector graphic. I did create a vector smart object and basically that's exactly what that means is that you can scale this any size you want and you don't have to worry about pixelation. Okay, so we will position that. All right, and I think we are pretty much ready to go ahead and save this out and load it into Keyshot, and we'll see what we end up with. So I'll go save as, and we'll call this board texture. Okay, and if we go back into Keyshot here. We'll go ahead and apply that texture to the board surface. Okay, and so I know right away you guys are saying, well, that didn't come in uh, where we positioned it in Photoshop. And what we need to do is uncheck this keep aspect ratio box and set the scale UNV uh, to one and one. And that's going to get us pretty close to, to where we were uh, when we use this as our reference image in Photoshop. We have the Keyshot 2 by Luxion up here in the center. We have the arrows leading up to the board, and we have the Keyshot logo uh, in the center of the board. Uh, now you can certainly uh, still click this position button, and once that's enabled, you can position the texture around more. Uh, that technique that I showed you, it's not an exact uh, precise met method, but it will get you very, very close. It is a, is a certainly a, a useful technique uh, for creating more custom textures for your 3D models. And I think we'll increase the scale a little bit. Let's do 1.3 And once you're happy with the positioning Uh, go ahead and select Done down there on the bottom. And that's looking pretty good. Actually, it looks like our Keyshot 2 by Luxion is being cut, cut off up there, so we'll drop our scale down a little bit. It'll be 1.1 1 .1 and 1.1. 1 .1. Okay, it's better. Okay, so next, uh, let's move on and we'll talk about um, the translucent material inside Keyshot. And translucency is quite a bit different than transparency. A lot of times people get this confused. And what we'll do, we'll go ahead and look at an example of translucent so that we can see what we're trying to create here. And this is a good example of translucent. See, it's not transparent, but certainly light is able to scatter through this material enough that when something's placed on the other side, uh, you can see it. Uh, common examples of this in the real world, uh, most plastics have some level of translucency to them. Uh, you know, human skin, leaves, basically anything organic. And what translucency does is it gives a very soft uh, look to your materials. 
And we've had the translucent material for about a year now. Uh, we did release it about a year ago. And before that, whenever you wanted to create plastics, you would have to just create the plastic material. And it does a good job, but I'll, I'll go ahead and show you. We'll do a side-by-side -side comparison of just the standard plastic uh, versus creating a plastic with the translucent material. So I'll go ahead and create a blue plastic here. And I'm going to increase the specular a bit, and this is going to make our plastic more shiny and reflective. We'll let that res up for a second, and we'll save out a screenshot. So I'll save this out. And now let's change this material type from plastic to translucent and we'll see what we get. Now the translucent material works off of two colors. You have your diffuse color and you have your transmission. The diffuse is going to be your overall color and the transmission is going to be the color of the light that's scattered beneath the surface. Now uh, a good you know, sort of guideline to use when you're creating translucent plastics and translucent materials is if I'm creating a blue translucent plastic, generally I'll set this diffuse color to a darker version of whatever blue I'm trying to create. And the reason is because as light scatters beneath the surface, it's going to brighten up that material quite a bit. And then I'll set the transmission color to a lighter version of whatever blue I'm trying to create. And you can see when this reds up, like I said, this material will get brighter and it looks like it's working on different areas of the material and what it's really doing is it is calculating uh, the scattering of light as it bounces below the surface. And you can control the amount of light scattering by adjusting this translucency slider. So if I go really high, um, you know, you'll see that definitely more light gets scattered. And this probably isn't going to produce a very realistic result with the setting this high. But I, I do want to be able to show you, you know, what this slider does and how it will affect your material. Okay, so let's uh, drop it back down to something that's a little more realistic. And you'll notice when I do go lower on this value, you'll see more shadows actually defining the ridges in this material. And that's because, again, less light is being scattered. See, right now, we have all that light being scattered underneath, and basically our areas that are in shadow are being illuminated by that light, so we lose the, the form and definition of this material. So if I drop this low, we should see these ridges actually uh, more defined, but we still get enough scattering that it creates this very soft, translucent plastic look. All right, so we'll let this res up. Uh, we'll save out a screenshot, and then we'll compare side by side the plastic material with the translucent. And I think you guys will certainly uh, see the benefit in creating your plastics with the translucent material. Right. Go ahead and save the screenshot out, and if we go to our renderings folder. Okay, so here's our translucent material versus our plastic. 
you can see with the plastic, I mean, we kind of end up with something that, that looks a bit sharper, a bit harder. Um, it doesn't have that near, uh, nearly as a soft uh, plastic sort of feel to it. Okay. Now the next thing I want to go ahead and do is I am happy with the overall look of this translucent material and I'd like to make the other parts of this this bumper here uh, translucent as well. So what we'll do is we'll copy and paste this material. So shift left click, shift right to paste and I'll change uh, the material color. We're going to go with a white translucent plastic and uh, like I said with the translucent material I'm going to set my diffuse color to essentially a darker version of the color I'm trying to create. So since I'm going for white, I'll do a mid-gray. And for the transmission color, so the color of light that's scattered, I'm going to do a warm uh, gray. I do like to add a little bit of color, um, just a very subtle amount when I'm doing translucent white plastics because it will give your plastics a little bit more life than if you just go completely desaturated. And again, it's one of those things that it doesn't take much, you know. Uh, subtlety will go a long way. Okay, so we're getting a pretty nice look there. And I'll go ahead and copy and paste this to the top of the pinball bumpers. And while we are working on the translucent plastic, um, basically down here, I'd like to go ahead paste our white translucent onto the pinball flipper. Okay, so we'll start to get that white translucent soft looking plastic here. And also I'll take the blue one from the bumpers and put that on the outer edge of the pinball flipper. Now another thing, when you are working on your, your models and working on your texturing, a really great technique to use to go work on an area very quickly. If you press Control Alt and right click anywhere on your model, it's going to change the camera's pivot point around whatever you click. So if I want to work on this flipper, and maybe I'm on the other side of the model, I can very easily press Control Alt or Command Option on the Mac, right click, and now my camera is automatically oriented around that pinball flipper. So I can get right in there and start working very quickly. So again, I'll take this translucent white plastic and I'll paste it over to this flipper and I'll take the translucent blue plastic and paste it there. And I will take the uh, metal material that we set up for the pinball machine walls and I'll paste it onto these portions. And let's go ahead and let that sit for a second and see what we end up with uh, with our new translucent plastic. Okay, so that's starting to look pretty good. I think one thing we might even be able to do is actually increase the translucency on our white plastic here and we'll darken down the color even a little bit more because it looked like our, our material was getting a little blown out there and we were losing some detail. Also, this uh, would be a good point to go ahead and save our scene. Always good to make sure you save often. You never know what's going to happen. So we'll save that out. And there we go. I mean, you can see how we really do get this very nice uh, soft look. And I think we'll increase the translucency on the blue plastic as well. And now that we've made those changes, I'll copy and paste our, our new materials uh, to the other pinball book.
Okay. So next, let's go ahead and move on to the other areas of our pinball machine. For this portion here, I'll go ahead and make this a solid glass. So I'll double click on that and change it to solid glass. And we'll copy and paste this to the other side. And I'll change these uh, screws here to metal and we'll give it a little bit of roughness. And the next thing we'll do here is we'll go ahead and uh, texture up these rubber bands. And for this, I think we'll go ahead and just use, probably go translucent again and just have a very, very low value. So in that case, instead of creating from scratch, I do want a similar translucent effect. So I'll press shift left click on our pinball flippers and paste it right there on the rubber bands. But I am going to drop down the translucency and we'll add some roughness to this so that uh, you know it's not a perfectly polished surface. Now one other thing I do want to point out, and it's in regard to uh, having transparent materials in your scene. So I have this solid glass here and on these uh, little bumper objects here. And look how dark it is underneath those surfaces. Under the real time tab there's a setting called detailed indirect illumination. And once I enable that, it allows light to properly bounce around your scene, pass through transparent materials and illuminate any objects that may be underneath. Uh, now it is purely a real-time setting, so whenever you go to the render tab and you press the render button, um, it's always going to be enabled. So you don't have to worry about it when you press the render button. It's just uh, disabled by default under the real-time tab because it does improve performance, so it'll help you work faster. But when you want to accurately uh, display how your materials look when you have uh, transparent objects, uh, you'll want to ensure that this is enabled. Okay, let's go ahead and hide our top layer of glass there. Simply right click, select hide part, and for this we'll go ahead and just create, say, a metallic paint. So I'll do blue for the shutter blades and more of a white metallic paint for the background of those. And for the aperture itself, uh, I'm just going to go with a diffuse material. So I'll double click there, select diffuse, and drop that down to a dark black. And I'll bring back uh, my hidden parts. So I'll do show all parts. And we're getting a lot closer to having our uh, pinball machine finished here. Oh, the other thing I want to do is I'll take this metallic paint that we've created for the shutter blades and I'll paste it over to these uh, droppers over here. So I'll press shift left click, shift right click to paste. And we'll copy our uh, metal rails and paste that around the bevel of those objects. Okay, so Things are really coming together here. We're getting closer. Okay, next, well actually one last thing. Let's uh, make this a plastic. So I'll double click on the ramp, change it from diffuse to plastic, and let's make a dark blue. And we'll add some roughness to that. Okay. 
Next, let's go ahead and talk about our emissive materials. And what we're going to do with the emissives today is essentially make these glowing lights uh, around the Keyshot logo and also in front of these uh, droppers back here. So I'll double click right there on our light cover and I'll change the material type from diffuse to advanced. And the reason I'm using the advanced is because we're going to create sort of a frosted glass material and that's what's going to actually be covering our direct light source. So it essentially it will diffuse out the light source underneath so that we don't see a perfectly defined um, you know, light emission source. And it will give us a very nice uh, effect. So on the advanced material, the first thing we want to do is go ahead and increase our specular transmission. And specular transmission, uh, it sounds complicated, but really just think of it as, as your transparency. And a white value is going to be completely transparent, a black value is going to be completely opaque. And the reason things still look very white and overexposed is because uh, we still have diffuse color. So when you are introducing specular transmission and you want to make a transparent material, you'll want to drop your diffuse color all the way down to black. Okay. And you certainly can apply color to the specular transmission. So if you're trying to create, say, a colored glass or a colored frosted material, you'll want to do that through the specular transmission. So if I make this a red, we end up having a red glass cover. Now, the next thing I want to do here is uh, add this roughness transmission. Now what this is, if I hover over it, you can see it says interior surface roughness for transmission. Uh, again, sounds, sounds a bit technical, a bit complicated, but it's basically just going to be internal roughness. And what you want to use this for is anytime you're trying to create that frosted look. There's a big difference between the surface roughness and the, the roughness transmission. You said this is internal, this is external. So you can have a nicely polished surface um, that is frosted simply by only increasing the roughness transmission. So we look here at this sharp specular highlight. The reason we see that is because we haven't added any roughness. So we do still have a polished surface. If I start to increase this roughness, then we'll actually break up um, that specular highlight a bit. Okay. Now both of these do rely on glossy samples. Uh, which we've talked about earlier on. So um, I'll go ahead and increase those a bit so that we get a, a better looking rendered result. And I will hide this part. And now I'm going to go ahead and turn this into an emissive material. And I'll set it to sort of a yellow color. I'll bring back my hidden parts and we'll increase this intensity. So as you can see there, uh, we are creating a illuminated light effect and it does a pretty good job. It's giving us an interesting result there. Um, I'll go ahead and copy our glass cover there and I'll paste it back here to these ones. And we'll also copy the emissive material underneath by right-clicking and hitting copy material. Or, of course, you can do shift-left-click. And we'll shift-right-click to paste. And I will right-click and hit show all parts. And that brings back our glass covers. Okay, and we'll paste our glass covers down here. I have this extra ball light here. And essentially I just have uh, some 3D text inside of this material. So I'll hide 
this. And again, we'll copy our emissive material. So hide this part. Shift left click. Shift right click to paste. And I have the extra ball uh, text selected by double clicking. And if I bring back my parts, I can see the extra ball there. And I can edit this and make it look how, however I like. Okay, um, now what we'll do is we'll, I'll go ahead and show you the real-time bloom feature. And that's really going to make our illuminated lights uh, look quite a bit better than what we currently have. If I go under the Options tab and go to Real Time, I can select the effects. And when I turn this on, um, essentially we get this bloom, which is going to be this glow. Uh, this is one of the only things that's actually calculated on the GPU. Uh, it doesn't take any sort of intense graphics processing power, so any graphics card will work. And generally what I like to do for the best results on this is keep a low bloom intensity with a higher bloom radius. Uh, the slider does have a set uh, value range, so 1 to 20, but what I can do is type in a higher value uh, than what I have available. And so you can see there, uh, we're starting to generate some glow on the brightest areas within our scene, and that's starting to look pretty cool. Now, one thing I definitely want to point out is um, when you are using Bloom, I prefer to have it disabled when I am working and moving around my scene. You get better performance uh, by disabling it and then only turning it on uh, when you need it. Okay, so that's starting to look pretty good there. We have one last material to set up. And that's back here on the bumpers. And let's go ahead and we'll use we'll reuse the lines texture that we created earlier on. So I'll double click on this and change it from diffuse to metal. And for our bump texture, uh, let's go ahead and load in those lines. And I'll add a bit of roughness there, increase our glossy samples. And if we zoom in on our material, let's, uh, let's see what we're getting there. Oh, also, one other thing I definitely want to point out is when you are working around your scene and setting up materials, you can always enter performance mode by pressing Alt-P. And that will automatically reduce your quality settings so that you get the best performance and you can uh, continue to work on materials. So I'll drop down my bump height a little bit. So we'll keep this nice and subtle. And what that's going to give us is uh, essentially a, a brushed uh, sort of effect. Where we'll have these uh, lines that run uh, around these cylinder shapes here. All right, so I'm pretty happy with that one. And since we do have these other bumpers here, I'll simply shift left click to copy that material and then shift right click to paste it. So then I turn off performance mode by pressing Alt-P, and we've got a, uh, a pretty decent looking scene here. So I'll go ahead and save this at this point, and next let's move on to lighting a little bit. Um, 
I did set up all the materials in the default startup environment, and the reason is because it's a fairly neutral environment. Uh, there's just you know grays and whites in there, so you know you're not going to you're going to get a pretty accurate result of whatever colors you set on your materials. Um, say if we you know load in this Luxion conference room here, uh, this, this has a lot of orange in the scene, a lot of blue in it, and it's going to cast an overall you know orange color across your materials. So you know, if you set up your materials in a scene like this, you might have a tendency to, say, overcompensate and, you know, adjust your colors so that they, um, you know, show up more accurate according to what you have with this lighting. And then if you load in a different environment, or say a neutral environment, your colors aren't going to be uh, exactly what you expected. So I, I suggest uh, setting up materials on one of our studio environments. It's going to be, like I said, fairly neutral. But for the final lighting on this scene, I'm going to go ahead and use this uh, factory lighting environment to provide some pretty interesting lighting. and I think will work well for the inside of this pinball machine. Um, the next thing I'm going to go ahead and do is enter performance mode and let's set up our camera. And one thing I, I want to talk to you guys about is depth of field. And depth of field is a technique that um, photographers use. And uh, I'm sure you've all seen it. Um, you may not be familiar with the term, but I guarantee you you've seen it at some point or another. And basically, it's when a photographer will focus on a certain aspect of an image, and everything around it will be blurred. And essentially, what the photographer is doing is they are, you know, directing the viewer's eye, and really, you know, making sure that the viewer looks at what the photographer had in mind. Is really accentuating uh, certain aspects of the image by using depth of field. Okay, and we have a way of actually uh, reproducing that inside Keyshot. And the other thing we can do is we can create uh, essentially a zoom lens. If we were photographing this pinball machine, being that you know this is actually kind of a small environment, you would probably more realistically have your camera positioned uh, far away from the pinball or the pinball machine, and you would zoom in. Placing the camera right next to the pinball, it would be very difficult to, to focus on it. So you can simulate that effect by pulling your camera back and increasing this focal length slider. And that's going to create more of a zoom lens. Now you can also adjust your focal length by pressing Alt or Option on the Mac and moving your middle mouse wheel back. That's going to increase your focal length. You're going to get a longer zoom lens. If you move middle mouse wheel forward, uh, you're going to get a lower wide angle lens and you'll get a lot more of an exaggerated perspective. So depending on what you're going for, uh, you, know, you might want a wide angle, you might want a zoom lens and you can certainly achieve that effect by using this focal length here. Okay. Now the other thing I want to do is if we were inside of a pinball machine and you know these pinballs are flying around at high speed it's going to be kind of a, a chaotic setting you know and one very subtle thing that we can do is we can introduce a little bit of twist on our camera and that's going to just ever so slightly add a little bit of chaos and uncertainty to this scene. And I think I'll twist it this way so that we get the uh, other pinball up here visible. And I'll give us a little bit more of a zoom lens. We, um, we still are in performance mode, so if I press Alt-P, uh, that will give us our accurate uh, 
quality settings there. And getting back to depth of field, uh, we'll go ahead and enable that. So we're going to make this pinball up front the focus. So I'll enable depth of field under the camera tab. And I'm going to select pick focus, click on the pinball. And that sets our focus point. It puts a focal distance, basically wherever you click in your scene, it will automatically enter that value. And the camera is going to focus on anything that is essentially this distance in key shot units. Now the blur is, is, is really extreme and we can reduce that effect by increasing our f-stop. f-stop is a feature that real cameras do have. The higher the f-stop, the less blur that you will have in your depth of field. The more things will remain in focus, uh, the lower you go, the more blur you'll have. Um, it does have a set range, but again, you can type in higher values if you need it. And that's a decent amount there. And the one other thing we need to do is essentially turn on our bloom. And we'll let this res up for a second and see what we get. Also, go ahead and brighten up the environment. Looks like we could use a little bit more light in here. So just pressing the up arrow to do that. And we'll let this sit and see what we come out with. And while that reses up, um, you know, we are uh, concluding the first part of this webinar, which was basically focused on setting up your materials, uh, working with cameras, working with lighting, textures. And in the next part of this webinar, what we're going to do is we're going to render out our images. So we'll talk about the rendering aspect. We'll talk about the different file formats that we can output and the benefits and drawbacks of each. And we'll get into a little bit of post-production. What I'd like to do is render out these pinballs separately so that we can essentially add a little bit of motion blur uh, to essentially create uh, you know, a little bit more of a, a chaotic effect with this image. Uh, we'll talk about different methods for achieving the glow on, on these lights here. And uh, like I said, we'll talk about uh, you know, just different render settings uh, that we'll want to, to take into account based on what we all have set up here. All right, so we are, uh, like I said, we are coming to an end here, and I will make this scene available online. So you'll have this, you'll have the start scene, and you'll have the finish scene available for your reference. So you're more than welcome to open it up, take a look, uh, and if you guys ever have any questions whatsoever about how to create a certain look, how to do certain materials or textures, you can always email us at, at support at luxian.com, and we're always uh, very happy to help you uh, create realistic materials and help you with your project. So please drop us an email, don't be shy, and we'll give you a hand anytime you guys need it. Um, so thanks again, I do appreciate all of you attending, and we'll see you in the second part of this webinar where we will uh, finish out our image here. Thank you, enjoy your day.